On the surface, it's just a soda pop. A cold drink you can buy almost anywhere. But it's come to be more than that. How did this soft drink, Coca-Cola, become an emotional touchstone for millions around the globe? Trace that story, and you trace a small part of the world's story. Well, I think Coke's great success over the years was in ingratiating itself into every change of society. I've often said to friends of mine that I could probably teach a course in American social history and use nothing but advertising for Coca-Cola. During the Depression, you could always call a fella and say, Larry, meet me down for Coca-Cola. I want to buy you a Coca-Cola. It brought with it the effervescence of American society in the effervescence of its drink. If you're having a bad time, if the country's having a bad time, if the world's having a bad time, it's okay because there's still Coke. was a good year for cultural icons. The Statue of Liberty was unveiled to great fanfare in New York Harbor. In London, Sherlock Holmes first stalked the literary streets. And in the basement of a house in Atlanta, Georgia, an unsuccessful pharmacist was brewing up something that started out as a soft drink but ended up an icon of its own. His name was John Pemberton. Everybody in Atlanta knew him as Doc, and he'd spent most of his life looking for the product that was going to make him rich. There's not a lot that is known about Pemberton and his life. He took some medical training early in his career. Uh, he had some training as a pharmacist. He served in the Civil War as an officer in, in the Confederate forces. And after the war, he settled in Columbus, Georgia, and began the practice of pharmacy, and also began the practice of trying to invent commercially successful products. He introduced pills, hair dyes, medicines, and never managed to make a success of any of them. In 1870, he moved to Atlanta, a booming, brawling railroad town still rising from the ashes of Sherman's March. In those days, civic leaders were anxious to leave the wounds of the Civil War behind, make amends with the North, and join the 19th century's Industrial Revolution. They called it the New South, and Atlanta would lead the way. The city's cash crop was cash, and Doc Pemberton was hoping to harvest his share. These are not traditional values of the kinds of characters we see, for example, in Gone with the Wind, who were interested in preserving the old traditions and staying on the old plantation. This is not Mr. Pemberton. Unfortunately, Atlanta wasn't any kinder to the pharmacist than Columbus had been. He still couldn't come up with a real moneymaker. But by the spring of 1886, Pemberton had yet another bright idea, and more importantly, a new business partner, a Yankee. I love the idea that Coke is founded by this odd couple, because you have this handsome chemist, a Civil War hero, Doc Pemberton from Columbus, Georgia. But we wouldn't know what we were talking about today if it hadn't been for this diminutive uh, Yankee uh, uh, veteran of the, of the Union Army who just wandered into town with a small printing press and tried to gain a career in advertising, and that's Frank Robinson. Robinson's advertising know-how made him a natural partner for Pemberton, who was always better at creating products than he was at selling them. Together, they decided to focus on that new idea Pemberton had been tinkering with, a beverage. 
they'd be staking their claim not at the medicine counter, but at a new American institution, the soda fountain. From here, from there, from everywhere they came, attracted to the current counterpart of the inns and watering places of colonial days. The new gathering place of a new age, the soda fountain, helping to make the 90s gay. Soda fountain wasn't just a place to go and refresh yourself because you were thirsty. It was a place to sit down with your friends, to have conversations, to talk about the politics, the, the culture. And so it was a place where people naturally gathered. They're important as new kinds of meeting places in a changing downtown atmosphere that includes both men and women, for one thing. This is a place where ladies can go without fear of censorship. They can go to drugstores and sit at a soda fountain and partake in some ice cream confection. And they were especially important to this Victorian age. At a time when the temperance movement was at its height, no decent woman, or man for that matter, could be seen in a saloon. Atlanta voted to close all its bars in 1885. But a soda fountain was a place where everyone could gather. Even then, soda fountains offered a dizzying array of flavors. Variations on well-known tastes like strawberry, lemon, or chocolate. All were prepared by mixing a thick syrup with carbonated water and adding ice. Pemberton hoped to come up with something that would stand apart from the crowd. For months, he worked in the basement of the Atlanta house that served as his home and laboratory. He added flavorings to boiling water to make a syrup. And every so often, he'd dispatch a sample to the soda fountain at Jacob's Pharmacy to see what people thought. It's very hard to go back to May of 1886 and try and figure out what was in the mind of a man like John Pemberton. My guess is that in his mind, he was just trying to find a magical formula that was going to sell. And so you took it one drink at a time. You took it one container of syrup at a time. People said they liked it. Let's try another one. On May 8, 1886, he decided that he finally had it right. It was a brand new flavor, and more than a century later, it's hard to understand the impact it must have had on the first people who drank it. It's not as if Pemberton had created a new kind of cola. There were no colas, period. The cola flavor is a very distinct kind of flavor. And it's something that you know, flavor chemists tell us is something that you forget very quickly. So that you can have a cola flavored drink and maybe half an hour later, you're ready to have another cola flavored drink. Of course, no one knew this in 1886. It was up to Frank Robinson to sell this new concoction. His first step, Name the product. Coca-Cola. It's catchy. It's like Route 66. Uh, you can't imagine it being any other way. Something catchy about the repetitions, the O's, the U's, all of that stuff. If they had called it uh, Elixir of Wild Mountain Grape or something, I doubt they'd still be around today. And because he was a bookkeeper, he had this fine 19th century Spencerian hand. And so he wrote it out in script. And it's Frank Robinson's signature, if you will, that created the famous logo for Coca-Cola, a logo that has remained almost the same for 115 years. Robinson also took out the very first advertisement for Coca-Cola in the May 29th Atlanta Constitution. Unfortunately, this first ad was almost buried on the page by solicitations for Pope the Hatter. It might have seemed that making this new drink a success would be relatively simple. Syrup? Fine. 
finely chipped ice, bubbling carbonated water. Yes, people talked about it, tried it, and even then learned the happy enjoyment to be found in the pause that refreshes. In reality, it wasn't quite as simple as all that. In 1886, Pemberton only sold about 25 gallons of Coca-Cola syrup. In his first year of operation, he made about $50, but he incurred expenses of about $76, so that's not a very good ledger sheet. Even worse, Doc Pemberton was not a well man. Before he and Robinson had a chance to turn Coca-Cola 